Okay. Check one, two, check one, two. Should be live. Today is going to be a working session on um, some of my own work. Um, and just a general talk uh, with everybody about just, you know, goings on, any questions, anything that's on anybody's mind. Um, it has been kind of a, uh, just a crazy week for me as I as saw so that's which, which is why I'm late. So sorry for being late, but, uh, I got a new job, so I will talk more about it, um, at some point, uh, soon, but, uh, that's very exciting. So it's not going to interfere with streaming or anything like that. It just has today because you know, it's just been a lot going on this week with that and wedding stuff. And, you know, as you get closer and closer to a wedding, uh, it's just a lot to deal with. I do think I'm 42 days away from my wedding. So that's interesting. <laughs> um, but how's it going, Torin? Um, but let me see here. Let me open up some some stuff. You can kind of look at some models. Hit the like button. Uh, it helps with the algorithm a lot. Um, uh, let me see here something. Okay. I've made a new document. Thank you. Yeah, it's a lot to celebrate this week. It's just been a lot to deal with, too. So, it's exciting to get a new job. I, It's very, it's a, I'll talk more about it probably tomorrow in my Discord conversation, for those of you that uh, attend. Um, I will talk more about it, uh, but, um, and then obviously, like, I'll talk about it in streams later, but it's not going to be ever be a focus of the streams. But, it's very exciting. It's literally, it's a, it's like the job that I would have wanted in a lot of ways, like not even in a lot of ways, like, uh, and was actually going to reach out and ask to do voluntarily. And then it happened to find me, which is very cool. So, um, I'm the director of analytics and advertising for a nonprofit that I'll name later. Which is very awesome. Very grateful. Okay. So, trying to make this screen so that I can constantly see your comments and see if see if this goes out because sometimes it has. I don't really want that to to happen. Okay. So, I'm setting this up so that I can. You guys can tell me if things go out. Okay. Just hit share screen. Kind of looking at uh, this. I've been working on a riddle a little bit involving a specific number. And that number is 506. And... Um, This number is comes from a sp specific thing right here. Let me show you. So this number right here, 506, is calculating from here. So it's it's 4 plus 84 plus 30, uh, 399 plus, uh, 19. And this is interesting because this number is very close to this other number, which is 496. And this number 496 
496. It's notable for being a uh, perfect number and it's a triangular number and a hexagonal number and a centered nonagonal number. And it is the 31st triangular number. It's also the smallest counterexample of a hypothesis that more than one, that one more than an even triangular number is a prime number. It is the largest happy number less than 500. And um, so this is very interesting too because it's the Euler number X is equal to 496. Basically like there is no solution. And it's a non, I don't know what this means, to be honest, but it's something notable. E8 has a real dimension of 496. In physics, 496 is a very important number in super string theory. Realize that one of the necessary conditions for super string theory to make sense is that the dimension of the gauge group of type one string theory must be 496. This group is therefore SO32, which is very interesting. And so the thing about this is, is that I had gotten this number 496 because it's basically just 10 uh, less than 5, 506. So I think that there's something here to this. I don't think that this is a coincidence. I don't think I'm just like searching this. Like that's a very specific number. It's very close to this. And what's interesting about this also is that when you start looking at these, the um, let's see, where is it? Fascinating, actually. That's really fascinating. Um, 32 is a very important number in this uh, because it's half of 64. And for anybody that's familiar with this work, 64 is the number of gaps in the 64 tetrahedron grid that I found that's basically like the scaffolding of my verse model. So the 64 red here, 64 red here, which is this is a liquid, this is a solid, and this is a gas. Uh, this is a solid, this is a liquid, this is a gas. There's 64 red squares in each, 64 gaps. And essentially, you're, when you start like dissecting this, you start realizing that, you know, there's 32 here as this this number that's basically like the sum of all the blue here. 33 is plus one. So, uh, but there, this is a very important number. So you start seeing 33 and 31. Obviously, 32 is in between that. It's just a very important number. And um, I, I'm still working on the details of exactly where it comes into play, but it's as as I've spoken about before, this entire structure is basically looking at itself from the inside out and the outside in at the same time, which means that that totality is 64, which means that from one of those perspectives, it is 32. So you should get a second monitor. Uh, I am getting a second monitor, actually. <laughs> so that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, but yeah, I am. Uh, I will have a second monitor very soon. Probably uh, within... Uh, by the definitely by the end of next week, I'll have a second monitor uh, arrive. It's already been ordered, but that's a good suggestion. Um, but uh, yeah, so this number though is very important, and 
this number 496 uh, is also very important. And it seems to be important again and again and again and again and again. So we can kind of like visualize it too. We can go number Maddox. I love this website as I've talked about before. 496. Other than you can't post numbers in there, you have to type them out. So two prime numbers, which is 2 and 31. And I've talked about this before. 31 is very important. Um, and it's it's fascinating because when you start looking at prime number differences, okay, let me see if I've got it here. Prime difference chart, 31 prime difference chart. Okay, when I started dissecting prime numbers to a certain point, you get this weird phenomenon where the difference between the difference between prime numbers, it goes one one, which is two, and then it goes two, 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 again and again and again. And what's interesting is is that the number of times that you get two is thirty one. Which is fascinating. And it comes to sixty two which is also interesting. But then when you add the one and the one, you get 64, count 33. And then you finally at the end get this eight. And that's a 72, which is a totality. So I'm still working out this prime number difference chart that I've made. There's clearly so much going on here. Uh, like when I first posted this, what I had posted was, um, that there is some work that you figure out and then you do the work, essentially. And then there is some work that you do the work and then you figure out. And um, this is definitely the latter. It's so incredibly complicated. There's clearly so much happening with it. And there's clearly some serious patterns that, but they're they're very difficult to to decipher i guess i mean you're seeing like 42 here 72 ending in 64 you're getting 31 as these differences and there's a specific prime number that this goes to that you get this chart and um what i think a prime number is essentially is a prime number is when a new is is essentially like the completion of a consciousness and so like when you get four primary perspectives plus a sentient singularity you get five so like that prime number represents the creation of a consciousness one is a prime number consciousness two is kind of like considered the first prime number and if, it's also interesting because it's the only even prime number. And um, it's kind of like I see it as creator and creation. God in the universe. That is where this number two comes in and it's prime because you're getting this completion of a consciousness. And then same thing with three, you're getting also this completion of a consciousness. And then with five, you're, it's four plus one. And it's very... It's just very interesting. Uh, same thing with like nine uh, plus two is 11. And it's one, I've talked about this before. It's like one by one. It's like you've created a consciousness. One consciousness has created another, which is like one by one. And you're seeing this weird symmetry going on. Not claiming to understand all this. This is so complicated. This is like the upper, upper echelons of consciousness research is prime number research that's just definitely true uh and they are they are super related like they're not even just related they are they are the same thing prime numbers come from 
consciousness and or they are representative of a consciousness and if you think about what a prime number is it is a number that is divisible by one and itself and if you think about you or consciousness you're like what is a consciousness a consciousness is a, is a singularity of mind okay so singular meaning one and it's you you are you you are yourself so it's divisible by one and by itself it's a prime number and that is amazing and um i don't i i mean we're one day like to unlock the secrets of prime numbers and their relationship to consciousness is to understand consciousness I think mathematically that doesn't mean that you can create consciousness it just means that at that point you will understand kind of like what creates consciousness and it is this moment of singularity of mind that is reached even mathematically where all of a sudden something is created that is divisible only by one in itself that's just amazing so I kind of want to focus on this a little bit tonight, actually. I wasn't really sure where I wanted to focus, but here. <laughs> Prime numbers and consciousness. We're going to have to do like a detailed stream about this one day, but whenever I look at prime numbers, um, I am always looking at it starting at zero, starting at one, and starting at two. So I have here like, this is a count starting at zero. Okay, you can see. Starting at one, you can see. Starting at two. And that way I can kind of see like what values are created in each of these and it helps me just see what's going on. It's always something, it's always fascinating. Uh, it does seem like almost primes have to start with one in a way, but it's more complicated than even that. Like prime numbers are the, like I've said this before, nothing will make your head spin like looking at prime numbers. They will just blow your mind because they just will. I mean, I think this is the, moment of cutoff almost what is that interesting so of of that chart i've yet to figure out exactly why that chart it doesn't it's not that it cuts off at that point it's that it restarts at that point there is a restart hap that happens at a specific number of primes. And so what you can kind of do with this stuff is, I mean, this is a lot of primes. This is two prime nine, 99,991, which is basically the 9,000, 593rd prime number or 92nd prime number essentially and this is the difference between it and the previous and this is the difference between the differences so the difference between this one and the difference between this one is 16 so minus 16 so that's basically what's happening with these numbers so the difference the difference between the differences and what's interesting is is you could go to one like this one and you can go scroll all the way up and you can see that the sum, I don't know if you can actually see that, but let me see if I can make sure that you can see that. There you go. The sum is, let's make sure I can see that you can see that. The sum is two. So even after that many prime numbers, the sum is still just two between the differences between the differences. And and just the differences, you can see that it's, you know, basically just one more than the prime, but 
With the differences between the differences, it changes quite a bit, and the sum is just 2. And sometimes it's negative 22, sometimes it's negative 6, sometimes it's negative 14, sometimes it's 8, sometimes it's 4. It's fascinating. And anywhere that you want to click, look, diff sum, 2. Here we go. We can try this a bunch of random ones and just see, like, what are we getting? Sum 10 from there. Sum 2 from there. Sum 6 from there. Sum 4 from there. So the numbers aren't that high. Um, and you could even do the differences between the differences and you could be like, see some, a bunch of weird things. So primes are amazing. They just blow my mind. Um, you can see some of the differences between the differences you can do. You can see that it's one, 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 which is four, and then two, two, and then four. I mean, it's just, it's mind bending what kind of weird patterns is. Patterns you can see the difference of the difference. One, zero, 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 one. It's like, and look at that. It's literally at prime five, which is four primary perspectives plus one sentient singularity, sum of two, average of 0.4. You can see amazing patterns in this. I know that might not sound like it's anything to you guys. It might sound profound. I don't know. It, but if you stare at these numbers long enough, they start to tell you a story. And it's not just because you're crazy. It's because they are a story. They must be a story. Otherwise, math has no meaning and it's just nonsense. And if you're going to look at numbers, if you can't claim that math is nonsense. Like, good, good luck. It's not subjectively nonsense. It's not objectively nonsense either. Prime numbers are, understanding prime numbers are, are the secret to understanding the depths of consciousness almost as far as how it unfolds numerically. Now, these models that I have created, I think everything from, you know, the quantum of consciousness model to the cosmological verse model, the four primary perspectives, and the creation model. These are the main models when it comes to the contextualizing all of this stuff outside of just primes. Primes are the next, the next frontier, I guess. 399. But 496 is an amazing number. Look at this, the sum of the prime factors. 33. Look at this. The complete list of divisors. 496. The one before that is 248. E8 has a dimension of 248. And a real dimension, apparently, of 496. I don't really know the difference, but I know it has both of those. 31 is the center, because 1, 2, 3, 4, you're not counting 1, and 1, 2, 3, 4. So the center points are really 1 and 31. That's kind of fascinating, too. Consciousness, ma the math of consciousness, and which is really the math of God, essentially, like, is fascinating and really difficult because you're having a simultaneous evolution of numbers. Like, you're having a bunch of numbers snap into existence simultaneously, and it will, that means that you're getting multiplicity of patterns simultaneously. They're not patterns built on patterns, they're patterns built on patterns that are also interwoven in a way that just no human could do because it's you would have to be aware of all of them simultaneously in order to build it and we just can't that's really what you take away from math when you really start staring at it look at this the sum of the digits is 19 
So the digital root essentially is 19, which is the interior sum of the quantum of consciousness. And the exterior sum of the quantum of consciousness is 33. Like, this is a very interesting number. Clearly, science is aware of that. So is mathematics. The harmonic mean yields an integer 5. It's a centered non agonal number, which means that it's basically like a root 9, which it has to be because this is 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And even when you look at the non calculative model, right here, nine, four thirty two, nine, four thirty two. Like, what are the odds that it's four thirty two on every single side? Probably a hundred percent. It's just fascinating. Four thirty two, four thirty two, four thirty two. That, and I just wonder, how did they come up with that? Like, how did people know, without that model, the importance of this number? Actually, you know what? I want to see. Well. Whoa, look at that. The difference between 432 and 496 is 64, which is the number of gaps in my model. And the number of tetrahedrons in the 64 tetrahedron grid created by Nassim Arme. That's fascinating. What's the eighty-seven? Interesting. I don't see anything there. I mean, I probably shouldn't delete it, but that's very interesting and important. Ten is one plus nine. Wow. which is 19 is 1 and 9. I can't believe that 64 thing. It's pretty awesome. I 
definitely need a second monitor. <laughs> I'm like trying to juggle too much here. Might even need a third one. But I'm moving the geckos this week off the get off the desk. I already moved one tank of geckos off the desk. I've got one more tank of geckos moving off the desk into a cage, getting my automatic misting system hooked up, and uh, uh, and we'll be good, good to go. We'll have so much more desk space. But 506 is very interesting too. Because like if you look at a lot of Robert Grant's work, it's a it's a lot of about the combination between five and six. And basically the hexagon and the pentagon combined. And this is very interesting because This is basically what this is, is like, it's, I see like the combination between five and six is infinite because zero is infinity, essentially. So that's what I see when I look at this number. So we go to Robert Grant's website, might be, he has some. If you haven't seen his TED talk, take a look. It's awesome. It's about like how everything works out for a reason, kind of. Okay, unified math and physics. One thought perceived four ways. Look at that. Now I want a misting system. Yeah, I need to hook it up. I got a mist king. For anybody who doesn't know, that's like the misting system in reptiles. And uh, I just haven't hooked it up because the cages that I have are not the most ideal for hooking it up um, with the lighting systems that I have. And I have to do some serious rigging and I have to pull animals out and they have to be like, because I have to silicone stuff and they can't be in the cages when I'm siliconing things, so... It's a lot of work, but I'm going to go on a trip in two weeks and not two weeks, uh, my wedding. So like 42 days <laughs> and, um, that I need a misting system so that nobody needs to open up all the cages while I'm gone. But look at this, the sum product conjecture. One thought perceived four ways, which is the four primary perspectives and some product combination is this. Multiplication, addition. This is the sum product conjecture, but basically the context of it in the most absolute form, not in the more relative form, but that he, he's looking at it like much more total than this. This is just like a specific, very specific context. He's got charts that just go, you know, they're looking at prime numbers and tons of charts and tons of graphs. It's pretty amazing. Different context, but it's about, we're looking at the same things here. But this one thought perceived four ways. Inside, outside, separate, and oneness. But let's see here. It's so funny. This is exactly like my background of my computer almost, but I made it. It's a little different. Like he's got the squaring of the circle going on. 
Actually, so do I, but I didn't do it consciously. And it looks, mine looks different, but... Uh, yeah, you can see here, actually. You can see there's like six by six squares of various colors radiating out. And you can see the uh, centeredness there. Just basically move all this stuff into there for now. But there you can see it. I made this after that experience that I had, that DMT type experience in the shower. And then I found out that other people have basically made the same structure. I had never seen that before. And then it was like, wow, lots of people have made this. Hence the background here. It's also the background of my phone. This is very cool, actually, I'll show you. So. Here, watch this. Watch how this lights up. It like, uh, it like illuminates from the front. You can't really see it that well because it overexposes in the center, but I didn't do that purposely. I just set it as my background and like the way that it's working is just like, it's just straight from the perfect center of this thing. It's very cool looking when you can actually like see it. I'm going to have to like take a Okay, well, it's hard to do a uh, save there, but it's okay. But it looks very cool. Fancy. Yes, fancy. Miss King system is very fancy, but my cages are not very fancy, hence why... I, I wish, actually, they were less fancy. I got, like, just ready-made cages, and it's hard to apply the mist king to it um because it's glass and the lights are just too over they just overtake the entire lid i can't put it i have to put the the tube into the cage and then put the nozzle inside the cage the entirety of it instead of just like the nozzle through the top it's just annoying but eventually i'll redo it all anyways Let's look back at numbers. But I do have a uh, a Amazon tree boa project though, which is my favorite snake, who is gravid, and sh which means pregnant, and she should be dropping babies by my around the time that I'm getting married. That's like my dream reptile project. Uh, because of it's a tiger. Calico red Amazon tree boa bred to a bicolor red Amazon tree boa, which uh, tiger Amazon tree boa, which is like the it's very fancy. It's fancy stuff. Here, let's look at. I'll show you. Uh, Canopy Lab Exotics. This guy breeds the best Amazon tree boas. It's both. Uh, both of mine came from stock from him, but one of them was bred directly. This is a calico red Amazon tree boa. I have one of these, but it, mine is even better looking than that. This is also a calico red. This is just a calico. Or this is a calico tiger. This is a tiger. This is a calico. So when you combine the calico color with this tiger pattern, which is the stripes, then you get this. And I have one of these bred to a bicolor which tiger, which is like this, is a bicolor tiger, which is a combination between that tiger pattern and uh, the bicolor color. So you take this bicolor color and you breed it to the tiger pattern. You get this tiger pattern bicolor. And so I bred 
basically one of these, but mine is red instead of, it's red with a little bit of yellow instead of yellow with a little bit of red. One of these, two, one of these. And um, we'll see what they create, but they make some wild looking snakes. They're just beautiful. Look at this thing. It's wicked. Totally harmless. Not dangerous at all. They just look very dangerous. They're very mean, but they are, um, they're not friendly snakes at all, but they are beautiful. And they throw, like all of these babies are related. They're all from the same litter. They all have the same exact parents. But you can see this one is, looks totally different from this one. And that's what's so cool about them is that they they can throw every color and pattern. So here's a striped, this is a tiger calico, I, which is what my male is. I should get some of these in the litter. Um, this was like my dream snake right here, that, that thing. And I have a male and uh, should create babies. Second dream was this, and I bred it to a female one of these. So... Uh, should make both of them, but you can see the variability. It's the most variable snake in the entire world. Like this looks nothing like that. Or like that. Nothing. They look nothing alike. You can get every color and pattern that you could think of in a single litter. They're the most variable snake in the entire world. Like, look at this. That's actually like the least desirable. It's like something like that or like that, just because they're the most common. It's not because they're like ugly. They're very cool looking. It's just the most common. Whereas like something like that, that's a double gene animal. So you get the tiger pattern and the red color and you have to breed for that. It's difficult to make, it takes a couple years. But they're just gorgeous. It's my favorite snake to work with. But they can be kind of pins in the ass because they're not very friendly at all. That one, look at that. That's wicked. It looks like the snake that tempted Eve in the garden. Like if there was a snake that tempted Eve in the garden that you had to picture, that's what it looked like <laughs> to me. Same attitude, too. Actually, probably much nicer, because if it had the attitude of these things, it couldn't have convinced Adam and Eve to eat that apple. These guys are too mean. They're not very charming. What do I think mine will look like? They'll look like all those. They'll look like... Like, I, I should get some of these. 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 Uh, I mean, I'll get all different kinds of colors. But at least those. Those four. I have no idea, though. This is my first time breeding them. I've never read them. It's going to be very, very awesome. But she's definitely gravid, which means pregnant. But Amazon tree boas are awesome snakes. So these are the parents of this litter. You can see there's no red animals here. This was like a, a total anomaly, genetic anomaly. We don't understand the genetics of these snakes. This is what's so weird is there are snakes where you, you understand the genetics almost perfectly. And there are people that just they get it. But this red color is a calico and it's supposed to be just what's called co-dominant or dominant. But that means that one parent has to be that, but neither of the parents here are this, but you still got these animals, which either means there was some sperm retention, potentially, or one of these animals carries this gene or is this gene and just is a low expression. We don't really know. It's very interesting, but it's just the most variable Amazon free boa. Like it is the most variable snake in the entire world. There's nothing more variable than it. This green one is not that.
I've talked about those before actually on the channel, but they're just amazing looking and not, like I said, not friendly, not good pet, unless you just want a display animal, which in which case they're great. I mean, that's just wild. That's a calico. I will get some of those. My mail is that. I don't even want to say this, but like, I'll say it. I bought one of those my, uh, originally, and it was like, I'd spotted it at a reptile show across the way, and I'd just gotten my bonus, and I wasn't prepared. I had set a limit for myself on price of what I was going to buy, which was not much. And then I saw that snake from across the room and I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't, I've never even seen one in person. I thought it would be 10 more years before I could afford one comfortably, which was not true, but I, I just hadn't, it was so, it was, you know, orders of magnitude more than I had ever spent on an animal. Um, uh, it was over a thousand dollars. It's fifteen hundred dollars, which is a lot, a lot. I don't spend on expensive pets. Um, but like when I first bought my first one of those, it was that much. And I, it was like my entire bonus. And I basically had a panic attack afterwards because I wasn't planning on it. It was, it was a snake I had planned on owning my entire life, but I wasn't planning on buying it then. I bought it and had a panic attack almost afterwards. Cause I just like that. I'm not somebody that spends that kind of money, like on a whim. And then it died and I don't have animals die very much especially not snakes but it died and uh, it was like so dramatic i have videos on my phone of, of that snake i will never look at them like it just gives i have like ptsd from it like it was i thought it had a virus that had infected all of my animals which it didn't uh but i had i like paid for biopsies and and autopsies on it that had been sent all over to labs across the country because I was just nervous that it, I had to basically euthanize my entire collection, and I did not. But um, there's very dangerous viruses in those snakes. Not for humans, They're, they don't affect humans at all, but for the snakes, they're very contagious and very dangerous. And uh, turned out negative on everything, but it just was a bacterial infection. But the vet killed it. I had got, it had had a bacterial infection that gave it symptoms of one of those viruses, and when I brought it in, they put it under, uh, and reptiles don't process um, anesthesia very easily because they're cold blooded. And they woke it up, and they start, and it, it started to wake up, and they just weren't paying attention. They didn't see that it fully woken up, and then it just didn't fully wake up and died. And they told me about it. It was, oh, I was a wreck. And then, but it, I had actually wanted its brother. I wanted it sit. I thought they were two girls, so I bought the girl. Then she died. I wanted her sister though, which was the best example of the morph I'd ever seen. But he wanted even more money for it, and I wasn't prepared to spend that. Then two years later, or a year later, or, or so, he called me up and was like, "I know you know you had that whole experience where the first one died. Like, do you want to buy the other one?" And um. And he gave me a good price on it. And I was like, yes. And it was much less traumatic for me because I I had prepared for it. It wasn't like right then and there. I had the money the first time. You know, it was my bonus, but it was all of my bonus. It wasn't like I had eaten into my savings to buy this. But I was only planning on spending like a couple hundred bucks that day, not over a thousand. And, um, uh, but this time I was like very prepared for it, paid it off over, you know, months. And, um, and then it turned out to be a male instead of a female, which actually was perfect because the one that I had always wanted as the mate for it, I was always like, if that one was a, if mine was a male, like I would get that female for it. And then turned out mine was a male and I got the female for it. And now they're breeding and, uh, they should have babies in the next, like, couple months so it was like and it, and my male is is like an ideal it was like the one i originally wanted it is amazing how life can like 
look so sour. And I know I'm talking about snakes, so it's like things are so much more serious than snakes. But still, like, it's a good example of when it looks like things have gone as bad as they possibly could in that situation, you know, obviously not as bad as, like, you know, family members ill or something like that. But as far as snakes go, it was pretty bad. And I've, I know of people that had much worse, like, people had multi-million dollar collections and their entire place caught on fire and, like, that was, like, the worst example in the hobby probably ever. The whole, everything died. Uh, it was horrible. But, um, uh, but this was bad for me. <laughs> and, but then it turned out to actually be ideal and years earlier than I thought I'd ever would. You know, by the time I'm getting, right before I'm getting married, I'm also about to, you know, in, inshallah, produce at least a couple healthy babies. Uh, it's her first litter, so, you know, you never know. She could have a bunch of stillborns, and it could be sad, but, like, um, you know, as long as she's okay, that'd be great. But uh, it, it ideally, there's at least a few healthy babies in there. So we'll see. But she's gravid. Crazy. I know. Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, damn. I had a $1,500 snake knife after having a panic attack after buying it. It was not fun. But, um... Back to math. <laughs> I was the most expensive animal I've ever bought uh, by far, even to this day. By far. By, like, multiple times over um and uh there there's nothing i can think of that i would even spend that much money on ever in the future as a singular animal i'm just not the animals that i like are not that expensive and i like some expensive animals but like i don't know lace monitors maybe it's like a mini komodo dragon those are expensive but I don't even know if they'd be as expensive as that. That's not that expensive for a snake. It's just expensive for me. You know, there are snakes that are thousands and thousands of dollars each. Tens, sometimes even tens of thousands of dollars each. But I don't keep those. Nor do I want to. But these are nonagonal numbers. A centered nonagonal number is a centered figure eight number that represents nonagonal, a nonagonal, a nonagon with a dot in the center. All dots surrounding the center dot in successive nonagonal layers. Okay. By the way, uh, Clubhouse, definitely something people should get on, If, as I said the other day. Um, if you can, I'm seeing some, I don't know, some lots of Clubhouse conversations going on that look uh, interesting. I'd love to get closer to the community on uh, here on that as well, where we can have some open conversations. But I think that most of those can't have like an anonymous account, which I like, but, uh, and it has to be live, which I also like, but it, it's, it does put you in a unique space. What about a mom? One of my green snakes escaped yesterday. I'm hoping to find it on a shelf or in the curtains. Yeah, that went well. Let me know how that goes. That sucks when they escape. Uh, what about a mamba? I would not keep a mamba. Even though it's my favorite snake. It's the snake. It's this snake. Right here. This is a green West African green mamba. That is the coolest snake in the world. Oh, but I would never keep it. It's very, very dangerous. It's basically a black mamba. 
but it is the coolest snake in the world. But I don't I don't think I'll keep deadly snakes ever. Mamas are next level. Like, you can keep them without getting bit. Uh, you can keep anything without getting bit. The issue is, is that if you keep something long enough, you get lazy. And it's when you get lazy that you get bit because you, you bypass your own protocols. And that is what gets you bit. It's not that the snake is too good or too fast. You can keep it in catch boxes and all kinds of stuff and and may, make it so that you basically never have to come in contact with it almost. But when you keep something every day for years, you get lazy with it. And that everybody that I know that's ever been bit by a captive venomous snake, I always ask them, how did it happen? Every single time, it's like, I got lazy. You know, that's what happens. It's amazing to me how much this is a snake. Like, when you look at this, the animation for this, or not even, we don't even have to do that. Let's just go here. You can see it goes here, and then it goes here. And then it goes here, and then here, and then here. And it's just like weaving its way through, back and forth. It is a serpent. Here's the head, just like, you know, it's just the head is always where it is uh, going and then it's just fascinating. It's also, we, why is my, okay, there we go. Now it's manifesting properly. This website. Eventually I need to do my website on a different, um, a different, like, hosting or creation. I use Webflow right now, it's very expensive. But it's the only way that I could do my website and in a timely manner and still have it look decent and stuff. I was just not good enough at making websites to use like WordPress, which is the way that you should do it. This was amazing. We talked about it the other day, but I want to look at it again. So basically. Where is that?
What's pi? What is pi in, in Excel again? Pi. Type pi in Excel. Okay. Pi. No. Okay, there we go. Okay, so then. Basically, we're times seven. And then equals to the seventh. And then. Um, divided by that or equals this It's almost alpha, which is like 137.5, I think. Alpha. Or uh, the... Uh, um, Alpha. Hold up. I don't know what just happened. Okay. Hopefully that didn't mess up the stream. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Alpha 137. With a fine structure constant. Oh, wait. It is 137.3599. Okay, so it's close. But not quite there. Best example of a pure number. One that doesn't need units. It's dimensionless. Okay, I see. Dimensionless physical constants. Find structure constant. I don't know what that is. I don't know these, these like, that, a constant characterizing the strong nuclear force, coupling strength. This is some stuff that we're going to have to get to know slowly. 
And I have been getting to know slowly, just Boltzmann's constant. Coulomb's constant, Planck's constant. Interesting. Okay. Speaking of like some of this stuff. Um, and just what's going on. Let's see this. Um thing. Uh anti gravity. We're gonna do a uh an entire show on this woman though, but Speaking of, like, speed of light and the vacuum and all this stuff. But this woman, Ningling, physicist, is someone that I'm going to uh, talk about more on an, on another stream probably next week, considering that tomorrow is Thursday and we're going to have our Discord discussion. We'll discuss all this stuff in the Discords. Uh, but um, obviously this is just more of a working session open session just because like i said this has been kind of a wild week for me but uh this but this by the way like discovering where was it the uh this very important today that was huge i really think that that's very important i'm gonna have to uh I'm actually taking a picture of that on my phone right now because I'm going to think more about this, but that's very important. Um, but this woman, Ning Ling, she is a Chinese American scientist known for her controversial claims about anti-gravity devices. She worked as a physicist at the Center for Space Plasma and Aeronautics. Make research at the University of Alabama in Huntsville in the 1990s uh, and in 1999 she left the university to form a company called AC Gravity so like alternating current gravity LLC very very interesting uh, nobody knows where she is anymore that uh, you know apparently she's either at Area 51 or she's in China and the Chinese have taken her back and uh, she, her work, though, has been classified basically by, a lot of it was classified, I guess, by the Department of Defense. She got a grant from them. Then she disappeared. But her company still exists. So AC Gravity. Well, why is Siri picking up some stuff? LLC. Doesn't look like they have a website anymore. But they do exist. The truth is the military has been researching anti-gravity. And I kind of had this like epiphany when I was listening to this story about how anti-gravity technology would work and then as I continued listening to it it seems like she came to a similar conclusion and obviously like this was like a flash for me it wasn't like a like a total epiphany it was like a flash of inspiration and it has to do with harnessing the forces from lots of atoms together that have been basically in the they are in the state of a bose einstein condensate so they're all acting as one then you can multiply the power that each of them has and you basically can channel via a lattice structure from what i'm understanding anti-gravitational forces essentially but she has disappeared and um 
our Navy and our, um, our government has been working on anti-gravity for decades and decades. Easily since Roswell, probably since before. And um, this woman appeared to actually be onto things and her, her papers were peer reviewed and they were not found to have any issue, which is interesting for, uh, to be honest, like I am, I'm just being honest. I'm surprised she's a female physicist and was the one who seemingly came to do this. But there's, there's another guy physicist in Russia who was also, his work is also being monitored. And, um, but the two of them, uh, are the, the people, but you know, good for her. Uh, that's all I'm saying. But she basically has disappeared, which means she was really onto something. And either the Chinese took her back, um, or, you know, we we put her at Area 51 and she's working in secret right now, which I hope, you know, for the sake of this country or what's left of it. But, um... I'm going to talk more about it tomorrow on the on the stream uh, in uh, in Discord. And if you want to join that discussion, uh, send me a link on uh, send me a message on Instagram and I'll send you a link. But she has disappeared. She received a DoD grant and then just disappeared. Ningling. Ning Lee. Physicist. But she, like, was really onto this. Does causality exist? Yeah. I think she just hit on something that they already knew. Possible. But not from what Bob Lazar has claimed. That he said that basically they did not know what they were doing uh, when he was working there. And But I've also heard conflicting stories that they did. And that Lockheed Martin made their own anti-gravity stuff in the 90s uh, as well. So, I mean, I don't know. They're, they won't declassify this anytime soon. I know that any day now they're supposed to declassify what they know about UFOs. Obviously, it's going to be... This is a PSYOP. It doesn't mean that there aren't UFOs. It just means that they're not going to tell us the full truth and they're going to tell us that they're telling us the full truth. But... And... Uh, but it's fascinating. Like... That she was working with lattice structures and Bose-Einstein condensates because that was like my flash of inspiration was regarding how you would need to take advantage of like Bose-Einstein, the state of Bose-Einstein condensate. Sorry, my Chuck Wallace are making all that noise in the background. I don't know what they're having a party about, but I can hear it. Um... Basically, a Bose-Einstein condensate is when a bunch of particles basically all kind of lump together in a way that they become one. They're moving as one. And um, not even really in, a, in, the, in the way of, a, of like a wave almost, which is where like a wave is like it's moving it's a little different. It's like when it's moving through a multiplicity of particles. This is when a bunch of multiplicity of particles kind of becomes one, which is different. It's not like a force. It's like it's like a multiplicity becomes one versus like there is a oneness of force moving through a multiplicity. It's a little different. But we're going to talk about it tomorrow more in depth. I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm not. This is like starting to reach. This is like new stuff for me. I mean, I know what a Bose-Einstein condensate is, but like becoming really familiar with it is new.
I'm still working on this and will be for a while. Quasi particles. Quasi particles and solids. Magno magnons, excitons, polaritons have integer spins, which means they are bosons that can form condensates. Like, the issue for me is that I don't think we can create gravity, but we can maybe amplify it. This is what Bo Bob Lazar said too. There's gravity amplifiers and stuff he was talking about with this craft. I don't think we can make gravity necessarily from, a, or even anti-gravity because this is complicated, but so I've said before, gravity is, or I said, love is the gravity of consciousness, which means that gravity is the love of the universe. And I mean that literally, I'm not being like metaphorical. It's a, it's a conscious action by the universe. Okay. Or it is an action by the universe to bring together. That's what it means, essentially, which is exactly what gravity does. It brings things together. And that's what love is. It's about coming together, you know, obviously. And um, I don't really know how much gravity is a possible force outside of consciousness. But I do think that it's possible to link a consciousness to a machine and amplify that force, potentially, or the manifestation of how we perceive that force. But I don't think that you can just make it from a machine. And, um, but when you think about these craft, it does appear like they link mentally with the, the user potentially. And I don't know, it's kind of like, we, we obviously were, this is all speculation. We don't know because they won't release anything that they know. And they know a lot more than they're releasing. And, um, and until the day comes that the government is like, Hey guys, we've made anti-gravity craft like essentially then we're not going to be able to really know everything will be speculation which is very annoying it's very annoying but um you know that's just where i'm at with this is that it, it gravity is linked to consciousness so much that i linking it to just it's to um I don't know, like, just machinery is a little tough. But what's interesting is, is that that woman, Ning Ling, Ning Li, her, her company is called AC Gravity, which is alternating current gravity, essentially. And like, there's so much wisdom in even that term, um, because as we've talked about before, about the alter the alternating on off state of consciousness being responsible for the success of AC current. That might be similar with gravity is like you can maybe direct it in a certain way, but you can't just make it. You have to direct it somehow, but you can see this is the AC aspect of the universe is based on is because of this this head body principle of like on off on off on off basically while you like and this is why we sleep and so you're asleep and awake and asleep and awake and asleep and awake and this is basically alternating current of you and this would be also possibly the way gravity would work too is that it would be this alternating kind of structure i would imagine it's very com. I mean, this is very complicated. It's all speculative. We don't know because Lockheed Martin keeps all this stuff in the lab somewhere in the desert, and they won't tell us. All 
I really wonder, like, I've been, like, doing some deep dives lately, I will say, on, like, why they won't let us go to, to, uh, to, um, Antarctica. <laughs> I really, like, Buzz Aldrin, okay, so, let's talk about this a bit. This is, this, like I said, this is an open session, guys. This isn't, there's no theme to this tit today, but. Uh, so Buzz Aldrin was the second man on the moon, and a lot of people think he's crazy, and the more I delve into who he is and the things that he says, I don't think he's crazy at all. I think that he knows things that he's not supposed to talk about, and he sometimes talks about them, but then people are like, shut it down. Like, the government is like, shut it down. Like, that's what's happening with Buzz Aldrin. It makes him look crazy, like... Buzz Aldrin, Antarctica, tweet. Like, he'll tweet something, and it will be hard to find the tweet. Which makes me really think that, like, he is, you know, actually, <laughs> like, finding, he's talking about things that are real. That's what I'll say. Here, let's see this. Come on. What's going on with this? Oh man, I'm being throttled because I started talking about Buzz Aldrin in Antarctica. I can't even search it now. Look at this. This is what I mean, guys. The heck? There are some things that we're just not allowed to talk about. And I'm not saying it's the government. I'm just saying it's someone. So, look at this. Buzz Aldrin tweeted something about Antarctica. I Google it, and there's nothing in the top results. I'm making sure I'm still online. There's nothing, okay? Nothing really interesting. Look at this. You can see nothing except the very last one. He tweeted... This. He tweeted a picture of this, which is basically supposedly a pyramid in Antarctica, very close to uh, a research station. People say it's just a mountain, maybe it's just a mountain, but it certainly looks like a, pyri a pyramid. But supposedly he tweeted this, and <laughs> it just says, We are all in danger. It is evil itself. And he just t tweeted a picture of this. And he was at, he had just gone to Antarctica. And I really think that he just knows things that he's not supposed to talk about. And he talks about them quite a bit. And then he gets caught. And then the government is like, shut it down. So if you look at the... Um, Oh, wow, you didn't even see that. Hold on. Here, look at this. He tweeted this. This is that pyramid that is near a research station in Antarctica, which, you know, for some reason we're not allowed to go to Antarctica because we can mess up the pristine wildlife of nothingness, apparently. Literally nothingness. There's nothing other than on the coast. Nothing that we are aware of. It's just snow. Like, I don't understand. Like, there isn't a single living thing in sight here. Do you see this? And yet, we're worried about messing up the ecosystem of, of nothing. But he tweeted this, apparently. And it was just a picture of this pyramid mountain. And it said, we are all in danger. It is evil itself. And he also stated... If you look at um, this interview with um, Logan Paul, uh, UFOs, oh wow. So, it's not this one. It is. 
It's not Stephen Greer. I don't know much about Stephen Greer at all. Um, it was the latest one. Why is it not coming up? I swear they mess with shit like they really do, guys. I'm I really mean that. Like I look up things on DuckDuckGo and it is not the same as on Google at all. At all. Like this one, okay. Um this guy got a, an interview with um with Buzz Aldrin and then uh because Buzz had said that basically there were a bunch of transcripts tra transcripts found that implied that there were there were just UFOs on the moon every time that they went to the moon and that they would every single moon mission was followed on their way to the moon and they were told not to talk about it and every now and then Buzz Aldrin says this and then the government is like shut it down and um but the I, the more i've looked into these stories the more and i'm not saying about antarctica i don't know but i think they're hiding sh some stuff in antarctica but buzz aldrin did say this stuff and um i'm not maybe he is crazy i'm not saying he's not crazy i'm just saying may, maybe he is maybe he's not but if anybody would know about this stuff, it is Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> and um, it's it's just very interesting because I thought he was losing his mind a little bit. And he might be losing his mind. But I'm starting to think that he's not losing his mind and that we've just with this whole UFO thing that's coming out, you know, it's supposed to come out this, this paper that's totally a psyop, obviously, just because they're not going to tell us everything. Then they're going to tell us that it's everything. This is going to be... It's... It just shows how much they lie to us. They just lie to us. They Especially about this. They've lied to us more about... I think this is the biggest story in the history of mankind. Uh, as far as, like, you know, since we've had mass media in our civilization. And... It is also the biggest cover-up ever. You know, it's interesting, like, I don't want to get kicked off the stream here, so I'm going to be a little bit careful. But, obviously, there's a bunch of stuff coming out with, like, Fauci and and that whole topic that I'm not allowed to talk about on live, probably. But, that was the biggest cover, that was one of the biggest cover-ups of, of mankind. They knew where it came from since before we even knew what it was. They knew. And... Because I knew. I looked at that, the way it was behaving in human bodies and, and the way that it was just giving us such adverse, strange reactions, which meant that it wasn't evolved for human bodies. It was, it was evolved to attack human tissue, but it wasn't evolved within a human body, so it wasn't functioning within all of our systems in normal ways, and I was, it was very apparent. And um, it was obvious to me from the very beginning uh, that this, it came from a lab. That's all I'm saying. And uh, they've been lying to us. They've known the whole time. You don't shut down the world due to a natural illness, no matter where it came from. You don't shut down the world like they did. They shut down the world because they didn't know what they were going to do, and they were afraid of the consequences politically. Everyone was. They, that's why they shut down the world. And um, they just knew it was totally different because they knew its origins. Every government on Earth, and they all lied to us. And they're still lying to us. And they're still claiming, oh, now we're looking at this and the evidence is starting to look this way versus this way. They've known for over a year. Well over a year, exactly where this came from. This is nothing compared to the UFO cover. Nothing. Like, I think they've known about this stuff. And I think it's much more select governments. So it is a little different. But I think decades and decades, not just a few years or a couple of years biggest cover-up in history and i'm gonna probably 
leave it at this or take final questions, but uh, I'm excited for tomorrow's Discord conversation where I can speak a little more freely. Um, but everybody who was a conspiracy theorist is becoming more and more proven correct on everything. Like, everything. Literally, I'm trying to think of, like, conspiracies. Like, the Philadelphia experiment? That's, like, the craziest one I can think of. If we ever find out that that was true, then I was I would assume that there are lizard people underneath Los Angeles. I had a client once that thought that that was happening. And I'm not saying it's not. I really don't even know what to believe anymore because all this stuff is kept from us. Like, but... I'm not saying I do believe that. I'm just saying, like, this, I had a client once that believed in, and he told us all about it. The guy worked for one of the largest insurance companies in the world. He was, like, a very successful guy. He wasn't, like, a, you know, a homeless crazy person. And, um, and he, told, he told us all about it in a meeting once. And, um, uh, you know, he was very successful. Like, total hippie dude, but, like, very successful business guy. And, um... But if, like, these, the more and more of these things that just come out as proven true from the lab leak hypothesis, hopefully I don't get kicked off from that, to, uh, which was obvious to me from the start, to UFOs, to, you know, Bob Lazar, to, you know, who knows what else, Tesla, Tesla was part of that Philadelphia uh, experiment, whatever it was going to be, you know, uh, and he he resigned from the experiment. I think that's like public record. And he was worried about what would happen and like that. And then whatever else happened after that was like, that's legend, obviously. But uh, I think it was record that like Tesla was involved in the experiment then he resigned and he was like, I don't really trust this. Um, there are lizard people throughout different cultures mythology. Have you heard about Project Nemesis? No, I've never heard of Project Nemesis. Um, huh, should I look this up? We'll talk more about this on the... Uh, it sounds like a... Uh, what is that movie? Um, uh, like... Oh man, Resident Evil? Okay, yeah, like a human clone hybrid thing. I'm, we'll, we could talk more about this stuff tomorrow. I'm gonna leave it at uh, not get too into this stuff uh, here right now, just because it could go any direction. But um, but it is like I lean towards it all being highly variable ecosystem of humans, most of which we're unaware of. Could be like, did you know about the X? School of Jesus. No, I don't know what that is. Like, I, I'm i just saying, the more and more we look, like, the more and more conspiracy theories, which I hate that term. Uh, Richard Dolan said it was created by the CIA in to basically, you know, to derail anyone who was claimed any, you know, any alternative hypotheses regarding the Kennedy assassination. And it was, and I believe him on that. That makes sense. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's just amazing how, how much, the more you look into this stuff, the more sh you, you find out it's true. I just want to know what's in Antarctica. That's it. I don't know. It could be just ice and penguins, but I just want to know. Like, why, I feel like it is, I do feel like we're not being told the full story. I bet you there, if I were to say anything about what's in Antarctica, I would guess that there are ruins of, that, that we're not supposed to know about. Like, I mean, there are some, if there were any, 
like conspiracy theories that are most interesting to me it is like what's in antarctica and what's on the far side of the moon which are really just questions uh that i think there's hidden stuff from us but i don't know one day we'll be able to turn to know i prefer the term conspiracy therapist yes that's very funny but uh it is very weird like what is going on guys i mean not even what is going on i like I said, I did a report on the UFO disclosure when I was in middle school. I was like, did a whole report, presented Bob Lazar's entire, like, you know, background and history and evidence and everything. And I, my report was that if the government was aware of an extraterrestrial presence on Earth, they were obligated morally to tell us. That was my my argument it wasn't even that there was it was just that if there was they're morally obligated to tell us and the more you look into it now the more it seems like all this information is controlled by like lockheed martin and you know boeing and northrop grumman and like they have no desire to tell us um they want the technology for themselves but i do wonder like how much they've actually learned from it and whether or not it's actually led to like serious breakthroughs. Like what if lasers and stuff like that all came from this? I don't know. From back engineering. Would they tell us? Ever? I have no idea. We probably would have to wait until one, one country was brave enough to be like, guys, we have created anti-gravity technology. And they showed it. They showed it to the world. Then every country that's done it would be like, so have we, so have we, so have we. Everybody start raising their hands. But before that, I don't think they'll ever tell us. Like, which makes you think, like, what are their plans with it? Like, is it the elite that just want this for themselves? I don't know. It's weird. We're in weird times. <laughs> like, we're in very weird times. Any day now, the go the the Pentagon is slated to release a, a briefing to the public on what they know about the existence of UFOs, which obviously, like I said, will be a PSYOP. It will not be everything they know, it will be, but it will claim to be everything they know almost. And it won't even be the tip of the iceberg. And, um, or it will be just the very tip of the iceberg. Um, but if it's presented as the entire iceberg, then that's like a big problem, which it is going to be presented as the as the entire iceberg. I think they're trying to avoid like people panicking, but it's weird because it seems like nobody cares. I posted this the other day. It's like things are so bad in the world, which I don't really I'm, I'm not claiming is true, but it's it was the meme was like things are so bad in the world that the government has admitted the existence of UFOs and nobody cares. And it's like that is pretty amazing. You know, and it's true. Hopefully not new. I don't even know what that is. But anyways, any final questions? Did you watch the movie The Congress in 2013? No, I did not. What is that about? Like I said, tomorrow, open Discord conversation. They're always a blast at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Message me on Instagram, and I will send you a link uh, to it. Um, but uh, that's a, we can go much deeper in that. It's because it's semi-private uh, into things. And like I, I like going into these things as well. Like I don't, I don't hide it. You know, I'm a questioner of anything pretty much, but I do like my streams to be sometimes like a little bit more concise, but this one was not. <laughs> As I said, this has been a long week. I'm kind of just like riffing on random things on my th uh, on my mind and work. It's a working session too, which we already, we did some work. This, that number of 64 being the difference between 432 and 496, very important. Futurological Congress.
I'll look into it. Sounds interesting. But, anyways, I think I'm going to call it, guys. I can't wait for our conversation tomorrow. I think it's going to be a fun one. Um, but, like I said, message me for the link. And uh should be a good time. They, they Sometimes they go well into the night. Um, and uh, when the society became cartoons. Huh. I know nothing about this. Maybe you can talk about it on our Discord conversation. Yeah, message message me uh, and I'll send you a link. But uh, just like Neuralink. Yeah, Neuralink is a big part of this project. Um, that I do talk about a lot and that I do know more about. Interesting. I mean, we are inside of an, of an artificial intelligence as the head of a hive mind that is basically like a bunch of neural link connected humans, but we'll talk, we can talk more about it tomorrow, but that is almost, I'm very sure of that. As crazy as that sounds, it's not actually that crazy when you, it's starting to be the, a leading narrative in physics. I'm not alone. Search for it with no regrets. <laughs> I will, uh, that's funny. I will, uh, speak to you all tomorrow. And, uh, thank you all for being here. Smash the like button. I hate saying that. I feel like such a tool. But at the same time, it really does help the algorithm. And, um, you know, like I said, if you see anything that's a clip that you want to clip and put up somewhere, make a Theory of Everyone Clips channel or something, go ahead. Just never take me out of context. Always make sure the context is there. Otherwise, I'm fine with you sharing, uh, anything that I talk about. So... Peace, guys, and I will talk to you tomorrow if you are on the Discord. See ya.